Okay, hello all you crazy people out there. My name is Michael. I like wizards and dragons and making games, and welcome back to Shaders. So I've now talked about the Vertex Shader, I've now talked about the Fragment Shader, and today I'm going to talk about doing things with those, using the various Vertex and Fragment Shaders to, uh, to do useful things in games. So let me close that. I'm going to talk today about imitating something along the lines of a Photoshop Blur tool. So you can see here, I have, a, I, have, I have the duck open in Photoshop, and I use the blur, the blur tool on its face. And its face kind of got blended in with the rest of it. That looks weird. If you want to apply it to the whole image, um, filters, blur, Gaussian blur is fine. Let's make it a radius of one, and that can happen. And you can see what's happening is that each pixel is, uh, is being influenced by the pixels around it. So the color values from the yellower part of the duck are, uh, are applying some amount of yellow to the... Uh, the browner parts of the duck, the bill, the eyes, the outline, that sort of thing. And you can do that in a shader quite easily, in fact. So let me go into uh, into this here project. This is the same project that I've been uh, working out of in the, in the last shader video. That's a little too big, I think. That's better. Uh, let's make a new shader. Um, I will call it shader blur. And... Let's see, I have I have closed everything from the last time I was working on this. So I uh, if I want to if I want to have the split window thing going on, I'm going to have to set that up again. Let's do it like this. Okay. So let me uh, let me remove the um let me remove the the dancing shader demo thing. Let me set the blur shader instead. Uh, we are not going to be taking any uniforms at all for the time being. We'll be taking some later. Uh, let's uh, make this a little more full screen, run the game again, and we're going to see that the uh, the duckling looks pretty normal. Nothing shader-like is, uh, is happening here. We can change that. So let's have a look at how you would go about giving each pixel a small amount of influence over the pixels around it. I have a notification on Discord. Let me... Uh, let me close out of that so it's not annoying me and distracting me, and probably all of you. So uh, texture coordinates, as I've talked about in the past, go from 0 to 1. In most cases, that's good, because it means it doesn't matter if you have a 64 by 64 texture for something or a 256 by 256 texture for something. Uh, the middle will always be in the middle at 0 0.5. Uh, one end would always be 0, one end, the other end will always be 1. So you can use different size textures for different things and not have to completely rewrite your shaders and recreate your vertex buffers and everything. But there are some cases when you're working with individual pixels. For example, when when you want to apply a blur effect to an image, that you actually need that information. And there is no uh, built-in automatic way to get that. So how do you do that? Uh, what do you do whenever you need some extra information that is not provided by the shader that you as the programmer know? Uh, uniforms exist. So I will say uniform back to uh, what would it be? I'll call it texture size. And over here in the let's make this bigger draw event, we can say uh, we can get that uniform. My screen suddenly feels not very big enough. Uh, and then we can set that uniform. That will be shader set uniform float. Um, What are the dimensions? I could hard code them in, but I could also say sprite duckling. All right, so shader set uniform f, and it will take two, two uh, floating point real number values for the width and the height. And we can jump back over here. Um, at some point, I don't know if I'm going to want to do this now. I will just scale up this image. I won't do that now. Okay, I'll worry about that later. Forget I said anything. Hold off until like five more minutes into the video. So now that we have the texture size, uh, each pixel on the texture, each pixel on the image, I think it's what, 32 by 32? I can't even remember. But each pixel is going to be one divided by that amount. So to, um, so if you want to, to use a fancy word, normalize the image size from zero to one, where each pixel is one, uh, and the height and width are whatever numbers I just said, and you want to turn that into a scale of um, 
the height and width become one and the, uh, the individual pixels become some value, that would simply be a matter of dividing one by the, uh, the original image size. So we can create a vector two and what am I going to call it? Texel size. When you're talking about textures, it's, uh, it's, it's common to call them texels instead of pixels. Overall, they're the same thing. They're a, a unit of color in an image. But um, when you're talking about normal images, there are they're generally pixels. When you're talking about units in a texture, probably in a shader, they're generally called texels. Uh, let's divide one divided by, um, yeah, one divided by, what did I say? Divided by texture size. I should be allowed to do that, right? Divide a, a number by a float. Is it going to allow me to do that, or do I have to do it the annoying way? It's going to allow me to do it. Excellent. So there are a few ways that you could do this with uh, with varying degrees of, um, of, uh, of, of precision. So the first thing I'm going to do is simply vec4, no, that's a three, uh, vec4 starting color is going to equal, starting color is going to equal the base fragments color. That's the texture, that's the, uh, the color on the texture that you get from the, uh, the exact texture coordinate. And also I'm going to actually call that final color because instead of having a starting color and a bunch of intermediate colors or whatever, I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to kind of morph around the final color a little bit. So to do this very simply, we could, uh, we could take an average of the starting color and all the colors around it, up, down, left, right, and whatever the other directions are. So we can add these together and let's, uh, let's open parentheses there. And instead of saying, let's do this a couple times. Let's break this up over, over multiple lines to make it easier to read. And I suppose we'll start with the, uh, the, the texel above the, uh, the origin texel. And that would be a vec2. That is three. A vec2 composed of the, uh, the texture coordinate that you get from the vertex shader minus texel size. I'm just going to rename this to texel because that's more typing than I want to do constantly. I'm sorry, did I say up? I meant to the, uh, to the left. The x, v under v, v underscore v, text core dot y with no modification. And then we will do, we'll go to the right. That will be plus texel dot x. And then now we're going to do up. That would be minus texel dot y. If you're using square images, the values would probably be the same, but the values in a, in a texel x and texel y rather because you're going to be dividing the same number one by the same number, but that's not a big deal. And then um, since you want to take the average of these five colors, the original color and the one to the up, down, left, right, uh, we will simply divide the total by 5.0 or just five point if you don't like having extra point zeros all over the place. Am I missing something? Um, I am missing a, a whole slew of, of closed parentheses. Much better. So this is going to be blurry. This is um, not really what you want. The fact that it's also taking into account the, um, oh gosh, the transparency is a little bit weird. If you don't want it to look at the transparency, you can always say, Final color dot alpha equals the original colors alpha, and that will um. To be honest, that looks even worse. I don't know if I will do that. Uh, let's uh, let's get rid of that. You can also weigh these in different ways. So you could give um, you could give the starting color more of an effect on the uh, the the uh, the final color than its surroundings. So let's start with, uh, let's start with the surrounding colors. I will rename this to the, uh, I will rename that to surrounding color. And let's save the original color to a separate variable. I am so bad at naming variables. Okay, fine. Original color equals that. And if you want to weigh them differently, 
if you were to take the average of the surrounding color and the, uh, and the original color and take the average of those, such as that should be a plus, yeah. This would mean that the original, car the original color carries the exact same weight as all of the surrounding colors put together. Okay. So that's a little, uh, that's a little sharper. It's still, uh, it's still got a blur effect. It's a little sharper. Um, if you want, you could always, uh, you could always take into account the diagonals as well. Uh, let's call this diagonal color and I'm going to, I'm going to start giving up on like up, down, left, right and start going with cardinal directions because it was easier to keep straight. This would be the Northwest color. Um, this would be the Northeast color. Uh, this would be the South, what is it, Southwest. Did I spell West correctly? It looks wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's how you spell the word West. And this last one would be Southeast. If you look at, if you look at a word for long enough, it doesn't matter how correctly it's spelled, it's going to look like it's spelled incorrectly. So now we also have the diagonal colors and we can factor those in as well. And now the original color, the, uh, the, the color of the diagonals, and that looks uh, a, bit, a bit washed out, a bit over bright, a bit overexposed. That's the word I'm looking for. I know my photography words uh, because we are now averaging three terms instead of two. Anyway, as I was saying, now the diagonal colors, the adjacent colors, I guess will be a better word for it, and the original color all has the same, um, all has the same weight in the blurring amount. Uh, if you want to, you could once again weigh these differently. You could, and this is really just math, uh, you could factor in the starting color an extra time. Uh, that would give the starting color the same weight as all eight colors around it combined. Uh, if you wanted to put much more emphasis on the, um, on the starting color, and I'm not going to just do a bunch of plus the same term over and over again. So let's, uh, let's say times four. So four times the starting color plus the, oh God. I'm doing this wrong. There we go. Okay, now we're gonna be looking at the uh, the starting color. So now we're only a little bit blurry. That's a bit much. Let's, uh, let's, get, let's drop that back down to, let's drop that back down to two. I think I like that best. The, uh, the fuzzing around the sides due to the alpha is still a little bit weird. And now maybe if I were to go and uh, go back to the original the original transparency, it would look a little better. That just looks alias. That looks very jpeg -y. So there are other ways that you can clean this up. Uh, you may wish to sample more colors than the uh, the ones directly adjacent to the, uh, the, st the pixel that you're looking at, the fragment that you're looking at. Fragment, pixel, texel. I should do my best to use those words consistently because I think that would be way less confusing. Anyway, for example, if you wanted to also sample the colors that were uh, two texels away from the starting position, I'm going to call that distant color. That is a curly brace. Uh, you could do this whole thing again, but instead of saying minus texel.x, it would be minus two times that. And then you probably also want to have, let me uh, organize this. You probably also want to include the, the diagonals in that. Something like this. Let me include that there. No help, that there. So we're now, uh, those, are, those are eight terms, so we will add those together. And now, we can factor in the distant color as well. We're now averaging five values. If you're having a hard time visualizing the, uh, the colors, the pixels that are being blended together, here's a handy diagram. At least I hope it's handy. 
so you can see what's going on. So I hope you are uh, I hope you are starting to see that there are a number of ways that you can affect the blurriness. If you've ever looked at the uh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that name. That guy's shader demo on the Yo-Yo Marketplace. Uh, if you look inside the blurring shader in there, one, he actually breaks up the horizontal and vertical blur blurring into um, into two separate shaders, which you can also do, although I think is a, a bit a bit more work than is necessary, since I'm just doing both the horizontal and blur and vertical blurring in um, in the same shader over here, and it's not that much of a uh, it's not like coming out badly or anything. What does this look like if I uh, if I don't preserve the alpha? All right, that looks that does look rather foggy. Let me play with this value a little more. The adjacent colors are gonna be are gonna be a uh, have a weight of three. The diagonal colors are gonna have a weight of two. Distant color is gonna have a weight of one, and original is gonna be four which is uh, 10 total values. All right, that's not bad. You could also, uh, you could also control this with a, uh, another uniform for blurring amount. Uh, you probably, if you've ever used the blur tool in Photoshop, where is it? If you've ever used the blur tool in Photoshop, there is the, uh, the radius, the blur radius. There is the blending mode that, that the blurring uses. So you can favor darker, lighter, whatever some other blending mode, which is just more math. There's strength, so you can choose to blur more or less. A, uh, a lower blurring strength would um would mean that the original color has uh, more of an influence over the output color, and a, uh, oops, meant to slide that back up to 100%. A higher blurring strength would mean that uh, the colors are weighted more equally. Okay, this is the second time I've recorded this video because the first one was a mess, and I hope this one was less, than a, less of a mess. I, uh, I certainly got through it more quickly, and I think I spent a little bit less time uh, messing around with unimportant details. Anyway, uh, code for this is, as always, in the video description. Why would I call it contents when I could just call it stuff? Uh, so if, if you want to go look at the code, mess around with it, change some values, see what happens, that's in the video description. My, min my name is Michael. I like wizards and dragons and making games. I have a Patreon for these things, so if you want to contribute to these videos in some way, shape, or form, there's a link to that in the usual places. Otherwise, I try and make uh, two of these things a week, which is currently one how-to tutorial thing and, uh, and one let's make a tower defense, because I like me some tower defense. The next video I make is probably going to be shaders, I believe, fog uh, in 3D games, applying fog because that's something you can do, which I think is rather interesting. And I will see you all later. Special thanks to Edward Hull, Indie Punch, and Zenith for supporting these videos. If you want your name in the credits and to force me to pronounce them out loud at the end of every video, head over to the Patreon page in the video description and join the fun.